Hey guys, welcome back to Justin Reads Romance. Welcome to another weekly wrap up. I'm so excited. I'm wrapping up the end of April. It is complete. I have a lot of books to talk about, so let's jump right in. There was a couple books that I forgot to include last week. I've been all over the place, guys. It's the end of the semester. I have two more finals to take this week and then I'll be done and hopefully like getting back into my YouTube content. It's been a struggle and I had to prioritize, but um, I miss this. I miss talking about books. I miss doing vlogs. I miss a lot of things. So anyway, just one more week. Let's wrap up the books. Um, Ridden Hard by Kim Lorraine. This was, I believe, a book bub book that I got. It was just random and I was like, oh, cowboy. So I bought it. And the hero, Tristan, is from this ranch and I believe that they're on TV. So this is the third book in the Riker Ranch um, series. So they're kind of like famous ranchers, famous cowboys. And he and the heroine Hazel have one night where she has just finalized her divorce. She's ready to get out there. She's committed so much time to her ex-husband and he was a philanderer and she was just like, ugh. And they had like infertility issues and stuff like that. After this one night, Hazel gets pregnant. So possibly, the husband was infertile. That really was never in touched on. Um, she thought it was her. They did use protection and she got pregnant anyway. All she knew was his first name and then her sister who is a YouTuber who who reviews TV shows, reality TV shows I believe, recognizes. I, I think she was watching an episode so that she could review it and Hazel's like, that's the guy. So their plan is to book a stay at the Riker Ranch because um, it's like an experience. All the guests get to like work around the ranch and have that experience about like being an actual rancher. And by this point, Hazel's pretty pregnant. So like she just shows up on the, on her, the doorstep and she wants Tristan to sign over parental rights basically doesn't want anything to do with Tristan and doesn't expect him to want to do anything either. But he is like very traditional. He's like, I think we should get married. And she's like, that's not a good enough reason just because I'm pregnant. We live like, you know, they live a couple hours away from each other. So it was a romance about them kind of falling in love after her already being pregnant. Honestly, I didn't feel the chemistry from them. So it was just kind of like a meh read. I gave it three stars. It, it was just, it was very forgettable. I didn't love it. And then, all Roads Lead Here by Mariana Zapata. Um, I'm gonna be upfront. This was definitely not one of my favorite books that she's written. And I don't know if it's because I am getting a little bit more impatient with the slow burn. I don't know if that's the case though because I recently reread my favorites by Mariana Zapata when I did the live show with Carrie and they still worked for me. That slow burn worked for me. The chemistry worked for me. And something about this book was just lacking in chemistry to me between Aurora and Rhodes. I really do like this setup. I think everything was there for me to love the book if I felt like the chemistry between the main characters was enough to warrant the slow burn. I think that that's what my biggest case against the most recent books that Mariana Zapata has been publishing is that slow burns are great whenever they're done really well and that chemistry is there. That chem that tension between them is always present and like you can feel it. You can feel it building up so that by the end, you feel like you weren't missing out on a lot of the romance even though they might not get together till the very, very end and might only have like one sex scene which is pretty typical in Mariana Zapata books. The heroine Aurora is moving back to a small town in Colorado. She was with this big country star. She was living in Nashville for a while and they had a very long-term relationship. And for people who don't know, she just says that she's divorced, even though that they weren't really technically like married. I think it was considered like a common law marriage. doesn't matter. It ended badly because he used her for a lot of years and the way that he broke up with her through his mother, his momager, was horrible. So I felt really bad for Aurora. She has some backstory associated with this town because her mom, she was raised by a single mom and her mom went missing after she was hiking on one of the trails. And her mom kept meticulous journals about all the trails that she had hiked. And Aurora wants to kind of feel connected to her mom and there's also some other things tied up with her mom's disappearance, which I won't go into detail. It's a lot to explain, but she wants to hike these trails as well. She's not a hiker. She has been living in Nashville for the majority of her life. She is a city girl and she does not have the equipment to hike alone, but 
one of the things that bothered me a lot is that she tends to hike alone all the time and she gets into some bad situations when she's hiking alone and I just want to scream at her so many times being like, why are you hiking alone? There was one time where her friend was supposed to go hike with her and the friend was like, oh no, I can't make it because of the camp with my daughter and she decides to hike this trail that was beyond difficult, beyond her level of expertise and um, she gets stuck in this rainstorm, she could have died. And I'm just like, it was like, why, why did you even do this to yourself? This was not the first time that she's gotten stuck on a hiking trail and people were worried about her because there's no service on these trails. And I'm just like, she frustrated me to no end about it. I hated that part of it. Okay, let's go back to the romance. So she decides to rent this above garage apartment and whenever she arrives at her above a garage apartment, she finds out that the son of the guy who owns this house was the one to try to rent out this garage apartment because he wanted to make a little extra cash to get a very expensive guitar. Rhodes is the dad and he is very put out with his son going behind his back and she begs. She's like, I, there's nothing else short term for me to rent. Please let me stay. So he's like a very grumpy hero, very gruff. Um, he basically doesn't want to acknowledge Aurora's existence and saying that, yeah, you can stay for a month, but then you have to find other accommodations. Like I'm being nice right now. And he is a park ranger or game warden. Game warden? Don't remember. I like these characters individually, but I felt like the fact that Rose did not like her and like avoided her and he was gone a lot of the time because as a game warden, he is um, spending lots of hours within the, um, the, the national parks and stuff like that. And his son, his teenage son, which I really like his teenage son, is often left alone. So it takes a while for them to even form a friendship Aurora and Rhodes, the hero, this is an age gap as well. And he's described as uh, a sexy silver fox and I really like that too. I had such high hopes for this book. I feel like I'm taking so long explaining why I did not like this book and I'm, I'm sorry if you did like this book, but it just did not work for me. I felt like they went from barely acquaintances to reluctant friends and you can see a change in him saying like, oh, I actually kind of like her company, but she is like, oh, I know you don't like me. I know you don't want me to be in your house. Like she's not getting that. She's completely missing all of his signals and that's one of the things that I'm like, there's no tension because she is oblivious to his changing feelings for her. And he even starts calling her like buddy. And the way that it's explained at the end why he's calling her buddy, it was so strange, honestly. I didn't love that. But my immediate response, I used to have this guy friend and I knew that he liked me and I would frequently call him buddy to um, make sure that he knew that he was firmly in the friend zone and I did not want anything more than that. So for me, he was like calling her buddy and she was just like, oh yeah, why does he call me buddy? I don't know and never thought to ask him. So every time I as the reader recognized that Rhodes was falling a little bit more in love with Aurora, she was, since it's told in completely her point of view, completely oblivious and still thought like he did not like her. Until towards the end, she like all of a sudden is like, hey, I think I'm in love with him. And I was just like, came out of left field, came out of left field. All she kept saying was that his butt was really hot. That was all the sexual tension that we got on her part. And it just, it frustrates me. It frustrates me because I think that Mariana Zapata has some really interesting stories to tell, really interesting characters. I really like the dynamic with the son and his best friend and her former friend who she reconnects with. I love all of that, but the romance was just not working. Okay. Next. Okay, I reread Just Like Heaven by Julia Quinn. This is a Bridgerton adjacent series, the Smythe Smith series, and they're notorious in the Bridgerton series for putting on musicales, and none of the um, women who play in these musicales has any like um, musical bone in their body. So everyone just kind of grins and bears when it comes to the Smythe Smith musicale because they can't snub them. It's like tradition to attend these. I love Honoria. I love Marcus. Um, Marcus is her brother's best friend. Daniel, her brother, is not in the country. He dueled somebody and um, injured the other dueler, which normally the gentlemanly thing to do is like shoot in the air and like your honor is like, you know, satisfied and you don't have to go further than that. So Daniel's out of the country. But what I really like about this book is even though it's a brother's, um, best friend romance. It's also a friends to lovers romance because Honoria and Marcus have this chemistry and relationship that you only get from knowing somebody 
since you were like six years old, like Honoria was six years old whenever she met Marcus, who was like 11 or 12. And I love their dynamic. I love their dynamic. This is really fun. It's almost like a rom-com. I laugh so much during this book. I'm so glad that I reread it for the podcast. Five stars, obviously. Then, oh, did I write the Mariana Zapata book? I don't think so. I'm tempted to give it a 2.5 stars. I am. I feel like Mariana Zapata, <laughs> so sorry to talk about this again. I feel like Mariana Zapata focuses more on including like um, potty humor, like bodily waste humor into her books, which normally does not bother me, but like, okay, we get it. Diarrhea, diarrhea. Oh my God. Okay. Can we move on? Chemistry. I want the chemistry, not the diarrhea. Mariana Zapata. Okay. <clears throat> Next, I read Shanna by Kathleen Woodowis. This was the first Kathleen Woodowis that I read. I read it for the historical Hellions book club. I was featured on the live show. I had um, a great time talking to Jess and Samantha about this book. This was a long book. This book, my copy is almost 700 pages. It's insane. And the heroine is very unlikable for the majority of this book. The hero, which is kind of surprising in these old school historical romances, this was written in 1977. The hero is gone for the heroine. And like he has the patience of a saint because she is pretty terrible to him. She wants to get married because her father's like, if you don't get married within the next year, I'm going to pick your husband for you. She decides to marry this guy who's in prison and set to be hung like very soon. And his name is Ruark uh, Beauchamp and <laughs> he does not die. And he follows her basically. Well, it's kind of like fate. He ends up on her father's island in the um, Caribbean and ends up by being a bond slave. So he's working off his debt and the chemistry between these two is really hot. There is a lot of sex scenes in this book. She's a little brat until almost three fourths of the way into this book. And then she starts her redeeming process. And I really like that transformation in her. I wish it happened sooner. If there was 200 pages pulled out of this book, this could be one of my favorite, like really old school historical romance novels. Ruark has some of the best lines. I love him. He was an amazing hero amazing and usually heroes in old school historical romances are like alpha holes and douchebags and there's lots of like non-consensual scenes and there really wasn't any in this book um maybe one technicality in the very beginning right whenever they're married because he was like if i'm gonna give you my name beauchamp then i would like to claim my husbandly rights and we need to sleep together but she like kind of double crosses him but he lets the tip slip in <laughs> anyway I really like this book. I'm gonna give it like 3.75 stars, so it's gonna be rounded up to a four, which is crazy. Next, I reread The Hookup by Kristen Callahan. I read this these books um, a couple years ago, completely forgot the plot to every single one of them. These are the first books by Kristen Callahan I ever read. They're sports romances, they're college romances, new adult, and Drew, the hero of this book, is phenomenal. He is such a sweetheart and he wears his heart on his sleeve for Anna. Anna is a little bit of a prickly heroine and she annoyed me a little bit. And I feel like she had too many conflicts. Like she had abandonment issues because her father left her. Um, she didn't like football because, you know, the whole jock football scene. She was bullied in high school and she also had some body image issues. And then her mom also dates really just terrible she has terrible taste in men and I don't understand why her mom, a very intelligent doctor, picks these men. Anna resists Drew a lot and when they start like hooking up, he obviously wants more right from the beginning but she's just like, it's just sex. She has this thing and it's become like a pet peeve that I recognize. It doesn't often happen in romance novels, at least the ones that I've read, but when it does, I hate it, is the, okay, we can have sex but there's a no kissing rule and I'm just like, you're gonna let this person have access to all of your body, but kissing is where it draws the line into this is too intimate. And like, it's so pretty woman, I'm just like, no. Anyway, so I really enjoyed this reread. I'd probably give this book 3.75 stars. I'll round it up to four stars. I originally rated it four stars. I think it could have been cut shorter. She needs to have less conflicting issues. She has a lot, lot of issues, but Drew saved it for me. Drew is amazing. I love it. I do want to read the next one in the series, like reread it because I don't remember it. I forgot to wrap up Darling Beast last week. How? How? Please tell me how. This is one of my favorite books in the Maiden Lane series. Whew. 
Apollo is, I want to cry. So Apollo is the brother of, oh my God, blanking on her name. Previous book in Duke of Midnight. What is her name? Artemis? Artemis. Yeah, that's right. Cause they're Greek gods. Apollo was put in Bedlam for being insane because he was caught with a knife in his hand and his three friends murdered and he no doesn't remember anything about this. Artemis never believed that her brother actually committed these murders and thinks that he was set up and stuff. And so she, in the previous book, kind of broke him out of Bedlam and he's on the run. And he also had invested in this pleasure garden, which burned down in the previous book as well. So he is working as the landscaper to um, rebuild this pleasure garden with his friend Asa McPeace. His romance is with like one of the most famous actresses and everyone really loves her, Lily. I freaking love Lily so much. She has a little boy and um, his name's Indio. So freaking cute. I swoon so hard for this romance. It's just great. It's just so great. I love it. Let's see the step back. I don't remember. I love Elizabeth Hoyt step backs. I think I've said this before. Ooh, so beastly. Love. Apollo. I love him. He's one of my favorite heroes that Elizabeth Hoyt has written. Period. Also, we have a live show that we're going to do with Crystal, Jen, and Tiffany because we've all recently read the Maiden Lane series and I still have two more to read, but we're going to talk about our favorite ones and why they're our favorite ones, but Apollo just takes the cake for me, so there's that insider information. Five stars for that book, five plus stars. Next, I read Dearest Rogue. This is one of the only ones that I actually don't have a paperback copy of, and I need it, and I need that step back because it is amazing, but Dearest Rogue is Phoebe, and Phoebe is blind. She started to lose her sight whenever she was young, and now she's like completely blind, and she has a bodyguard, Captain Trevelyan. He used to be a dragoon, and her brother, her overprotective brother, who he's kind of an ass, <laughs> um, hires Captain James to make sure that, um, to watch over her. There's multiple kidnapping attempts that is happening during this book. And I honestly really didn't enjoy this story when it was in like London, but there is a switch in scenery, um, not quite halfway um, into the book. And we go to like the countryside and all of those scenes were amazing. Like that's where I felt like all the chemistry was coming through with Phoebe. I felt like Phoebe sounded a little bit more mature whenever she was out there. For some reason, she always says like she doesn't want her brother to treat her like a little kid, but some of the things that she does and says does come off as childish. So especially like her behavior towards Captain James Trevelyan, who's only trying to keep her safe. But she is bucking at the reins because she's like, I don't want to be this kept little doll. Like just because I'm blind doesn't mean I can't experience life. So I sympathize with that. Ended up by giving this book four stars. I forgot to grab this one um, before I sat down. So I had to hurry up and go grab it. And um, yeah, step back half to love it. So the next book in the Maiden Lane series was Sweetest Scoundrel. I was laughing with Jen because I kept saying, um, what was Sweet Oblivion or something like that? I kept saying that title. Jen's like, do you mean Sweetest Scoundrel? I'm like, yes. I'm like, I don't know why I kept replacing this title with something that it was not. But Sweetest Scoundrel was a surprise. I started out reading this book Asa Makepeace, which I mentioned before in Darling Beast, is one of the friends of Apollo. And he's the one that owns the majority stake in the pleasure gardens that he's trying to rebuild after a fire destroyed it. And he's kind of like, he's a scoundrel. He sleeps around and stuff and he has a tumultuous relationship with his family because he really loves the arts and stuff. And if you read any of the Make Peace books previous to this, then you know that their father was pretty strict, pretty like pious type of thing. So Asa just kind of like separates himself from his family and he doesn't even call himself Asa Make Peace at all. His name is Mr. Hart and that's what everyone calls him. The heroine is Eve Dunwoody and Dinwoody. Eve Dinwoody. We see her in previous books and we find out that she is the half-sister of the Duke of Montgomery, Valentine. And she is, I love when we have books with a heroine who is not like conventionally pretty. Like she knows that she's not a beauty. And when Asa meets her, 
he lists all the things that she's lacking. She's lacking a bosom, her face is a little too angular, and she looks a little too severe and stuff like that. And so this is a pairing. This is the hero and the heroine. They do not like each other on sight. She is threatening, since um, the Duke of Montgomery has offered to become an investor and give them the cash that they need to rebuild this pleasure garden. So he has a stake in the pleasure garden as well. He is on the run after the last book. <laughs> which I won't go into details because it's kind of spoilers for um, Dearest Rogue. So Eve is in charge of all the money and she thinks that this investment is just not worth it. And so she wants to cut off the cash flow to Ace and Make Peace. And he has to convince her that it is still a good idea to fund his pleasure garden and the rebuilding and the expense is going to be worth it in the end. So this is their romance and the slow and gradual way that these characters fall in love is so beautiful i ended up by giving this book five stars because in the beginning i was like man ace is a little bit of an asshole i don't know if i like him it was so great i loved it eve has some trauma that she's experienced in her past and it's kind of like the start of a new story arc in the maiden lanes there's different kinds of story arcs that are hap that's happening and this is the start of like a new one involving um the thing that happened to her in the past and I freaking love this book a lot, five stars. <laughs> and then finally I read Duke of Sen, which this is Valentine's book, The Duke of Montgomery. And I was a little bit nervous going in because I know that Jen and Crystal did not like this book a ton. Val is the, is the villain. He's done some villainous things in the past. In my opinion, nothing that I could not forgive him for. It almost felt like he was like semi trying to be a villain, semi trying to do some bad things, but like, he really didn't do anything that I was just like, oh my God, I don't know how you're gonna get me to love him. I was very curious about his past. He's experienced some trauma as well, just as Eve, but he uses this persona that he's created as this asshole who collects, basically blackmails a bunch of people because it's associated with his trauma, what he went through whenever he was a child. His father was a horrible man into some very horrible things. There's this thing called the, this group called the Lords of Chaos, which was lightly touched on in Sweetest Scoundrel that we get to find out more information about in this book through Val's point of view. And you, you can tell that Val has not unpacked his trauma. He is still that scared little boy with too much responsibility being responsible for his sister, Eve. And it's almost like he wants to hurt other people before they hurt him. I did end up by giving this book four stars and it's not because I didn't like Val and I thought he was irredeemable or anything like that. I really enjoyed his romance with his housekeeper, basically. Bridget's kind of there as a spy. She's trying to help some people who he has um, been blackmailing. She wants to get like the letters that he has copies of so he won't be able to blackmail certain people. And she's the bastard daughter of um, a character who is earlier on, who we meet earlier on in the books, and also the half-sister of one of the heroes in a previous book. I'm going to kind of save that for, because this is so far into the series, I don't want to like start talking about stuff. But one of the things that I didn't truly enjoy was the level of resolution that we get in the with the Lords of Chaos plotline. I felt like since Val was so involved with this group, this organization via his father's involvement with it, I felt like I wanted Val to have more motivation to bring them down. I understand why that wasn't his top priority. Like I said, he has... He's, he was traumatized by stuff that happened whenever he was young and his father was a horrible person. It reminds me a lot of the Mortal Instruments actually. Funnily enough, the villain was named Valentine and he pulled some similar stuff on um, Valentine's dad as the Valentine in the Mortal Instruments series did on Jace. So I don't expect him to just like bring down this organization in this book, but I felt like he should have had a little bit more initiative, like a plan to bring them down. But by the end of this book, he kind of like passes off some information that he has, which is fine. I just wish there was a little bit more to do with that. I felt like the ending, there was like a final little conflict at the end and it was rushed through very fast. So that's why this book gives four stars. Then I finally read Dead Man Walking. This was, a spinner wheel pick for my April TBR. And I started this book pretty early on in April. I had to put it down a couple times because I was not feeling this. So something to know about 
um, my relationship with the series, the Men of the Fallen series. This is an MC romance series. It's not my favorite trope and romance MCs. I don't tend to love them. And Gianna Darling's books, I either really love them or really dislike them. I really love Welcome to the Dark Side and I really loved Inked and Lies. And Inked and Lies is the book right before this one. So I was really excited about Priest and B. Priest is the enforcer and he is supposed to be like a psychopath. He doesn't have like any emotions and he kind of enjoys killing. He very much enjoys his position in this MC. And B is the younger sister of um, the heroine in Welcome to the Dark Side, Lulu. Lulu's married to the president of this MC. And B's like kind of like the good girl. There was just too much light and dark metaphors taking place. There was a bunch of, bunch of Hades and Persephone references. There was a bunch of, you know, angel and demon references, like B's the angel, he's the demon. She's Persephone and he's Hades. And she's light and he's dark. And sometimes those very like purple prosy things could really work for me in books if I'm feeling the characters and their chemistry and stuff. But I wasn't feeling the chemistry as much with B and Priest. I think that, that these characters definitely belong with each other. I just wanted more connection with me and the characters. <laughs> that makes sense. I just feel like B was the type of girl where she's just like, I've always been a good girl all my life, but I've been secretly attracted to bad boys. Fine, I really like opposites attract. But there's a scene in the beginning where she goes on a date with this guy because she's like, well, Priest is never going to be with me, so I might as well, you know, date around. I'm young. I need to kind of, like, move on with my life. Well, this guy, like, he wears khakis, and he seems like this, like, nice guy, so she goes to a party with him. Then she accidentally finds out that he deals drugs, and she literally says he became, like, ten times more attractive now that she knows that this guy in khakis deals drugs. And I'm just like, so you're just attracted to whatever bad boy. As long as they're doing bad things, suddenly you're sexually attracted to them. So I was wondering, is this attraction to priest really real or do you just like that he's bad? There was also a lot of knife play and blood play that is just not my thing. It's just not my thing. So I didn't really enjoy this book as much as I thought it was going to. And it's a big book. Like this book's big. So I pushed through so that I could say that I finished the whole thing because I didn't want to DNF it. I'm going to end up by giving it three stars. Oof, that hurt my arm to hold it up. Then I read The Princess and the Barbarian by Bettina Cron. This was also a spinner wheel pick for my old school historical romances. I'm trying to go through all the ones that I've been getting from eBay. Um, not just like collecting pretty covers and step backs and stuff, which I very much do love this step back. Very like... <laughs> her loincloth. I love it. This is a medieval romance and the heroine is the Princess of Mercia and she cannot become queen until she marries. And so she is, I believe she travels to Normandy to find a husband and she's not having really any luck. She kind of just wants to rule alone. She doesn't like that she has to marry somebody. But there's like this evil guy and he sees her on the streets and he tries to kidnap her, but this barbarian rescues her. He has been in like the crusades and stuff and he has a best friend and Sax is our hero's name. He kind of ends up by rescuing the heroine Princess Thera a few times and he has no idea that she's a princess, but he does figure out that she must be a highborn lady and he's like, I have done services for a lot of noble men and women and they promised me coins. I never got them because they were like, oh, but you're like a Christian. So it should just be out of the goodness of your heart. And so he's like, this time I'm going to safely deliver her to her, um, her homeland. And then I'm going to collect my reward. My favorite part was the journey, the journey back to Mercia. And he has no idea at this point that she is a princess of Mercia. And she's a little bit spoiled, a little bit bratish. And I love the way that he handles her. I enjoy this romance for the most part. It wasn't like my favorite. It's a little bit forgettable. So I'm going to rate this 3.5 stars, but it wasn't the worst. It was just kind of like middling. It was okay. I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad that it was selected. Definitely didn't have like the problematic content in a lot of older historical romances. So we love to see that. And then finally, I reread Toxic Desire. This was a podcast pick, the last 
book that we were reviewing in April, and this is a sci-fi alien romance. The hero, Oten, he is an alien, and his race was almost wiped out by humans like 100 years ago. So when they see this ship, this warship, spaceship, they immediately go on the offensive because they're like, we're never gonna be caught unawares by humans again. So they attack the ship, and the captain of the ship is Captain Nim. And everyone on board of this, on board the ship wears these androgynous suits and helmets. So it's very like gender neutral. Nobody knows what um, the gender of anybody is, and it's supposed to like make it more equal. So the ship is crashing, Oten pushes um, Captain Nim into an escape pod, but the escape pod gets pulled into the gravitational field of a nearby planet called um, Furion or Firion. He thinks that he's about to die because he's like, my people have seen the atmosphere on this planet. It looks like the planet is on fire, but they crash land and the planet's actually not on fire. They quickly realize that the atmosphere, the plants, the water, it all has this aphrodisiac quality to it so they are suddenly like filled with desire for one another and if they ignore it it gets so bad that they're like stripping naked my battery completely died i thought i could make it through that entire review without having to change the battery but <sighs> will i ever learn no anyway so it's an enemies to lovers romance i really love it i really love the relationship between um, she is a very prickly heroine and she has reason to be. He attacked her ship. He killed a lot of, um, her crew members. And so she, she has reason to hold a grudge against him, but I really like the buildup in their relationship. It was an enjoyable reread. It was four stars. That was my original rating. It still stands at four stars. I'm very intrigued by a lot of other alien beings that were introduced into this book. So hopefully I will continue with this series in the near future because I really like what Robin Lovett has set up for this series. All right, that's it. That concludes my last weekly wrap up of April. If you like this video, give it a big thumbs up. And if you're not already subscribed to my channel, make sure you subscribe to get notified at any future videos that I do. Thank you so much for watching. And remember, life's better with a little HEA. Bye guys. Mm -hmm.